Mr. Collarbone's nose now glowed like a beacon. He struggled, dropping pages, losing his place, but pressing on with the dogged, dull determination of a man who could spend all day watching one oyster. Nothing less than an attempt to blacken our good names in front of the whole city, Stowley was protesting. Unaware of the toll that is being taken, what can we say of the men who caused this, who sat in comfort round their table and killed us by numbers? This, I will sue the university, I will sue the university, screamed Greenham. He picked up a chair and hurled it at the omniscope. Halfway to the glass, it turned into a small flock of doves, which panicked and soared up to the roof. Oh, please sue the university, Rid Cully bellowed. We've got a pond full of people who try to sue the university. Silence, said Veterinary. It wasn't a very loud word, but it had an effect rather like that of a drop of black ink in a glass of clear water. The word spread out in coils and tendrils getting everywhere. It strangled the noise. Of course, there is always someone not paying attention. And furthermore, Stowley went on, oblivious to the unfolding hush in his own little world of righteous indignation, it's plain that I will have silence, Vetinari stated. Stowley stopped, looked around and deflated. Silence ruled. Very good, said Vetinari quickly. He nodded at Commander Vimes of the watch, who whispered to another watchman who pushed his way through the crowd and towards the door. Vetinari turned to Ridcully. Arch-Chancellor, I would be grateful if you would instruct your students to continue, please, he said in the same calm tone. Certainly. Off you go, Professor Colliburn, in your own time. <laughs>
Whirling like the edge of darkness, Veterinary swung round to the omniscope and Dini's collarbone. Two thousand miles suddenly was far enough. Continue, Professor. There will be no further interruptions. Moist watched the audience as Collarbone stuttered and mispronounced his way through the rest of the message. It dealt with generalities rather than particulars, but there were dates and names and thundering denunciations. There was nothing he could not really do, but it was packaged in fine language and it did it in the from steve began. But yeah, Steve-O, we really don't know when to shut up, do you? I heard about Town 83, where the, where the guys died in the tower and the distress of all by itself. Fast the keys from the in a tower I think we can Get man down. You should know that. If there is no activity in 10 minutes when the signal the key is stopping, the drum drops the jacquard into the slot and the cat falls. The tower sends the help sign. snow. We shift code, she thought. It's what we do. Up on the tower, watching the star-like twinkle of the trunk in the clear, freezing air, she wondered what Grandad most feared. Those dead Stevens! A look of fervid relief passed across Devious Collarbone's face just before the omniscope went blank. Mr. Pony, you are the chief engineer of the Grand Trunk, are you not? said Veterinar before the battle could rise again. The engineer, suddenly the focus of attention, backed away, waving his hands frantically. Please, your lord, I'm just an engineer, I don't know anything. Calm yourself, please. Have you heard that these souls of dead men travel on the trunk? Oh, yes, your lordship. 
Is it true? Well, there, uh, Pony looked round a hunted man. He got his pink flimsies, and they would show everyone that he was nothing more than a man trying to make things work. But right now, all the final side was the truth. He took refuge in it. I can't see how it works. Well, sometimes when you're up in town of the night and the shutters are rattling and the wind's singing in the rigging, well, you might think it's true. I believe there is a tradition called sending the home. The truck was dark before we ran the message, so I don't see how the message could have got on. Unless, of course, the dead put it there, said Lord Betanari. Mr. Pony, for the good of your soul and not least your body, you will go now to the Tumble Tower, escort my body to the and send a brief message to all the towers. You will take the eight tapes, which I believe are known as drum rovers, to all the towers on the ground trunk. I understand that they show a record of all messages originating at that tower which cannot be readily accomplished. That will take weeks to do, sir, Pony protested. An early start in the morning would seem in order then, said Lord Beckenard. suddenly spotted that the smell of the long way from Ankh might be a very healthy option just now, nodded and said, Right you are, my lord. The grand trunk Private property! Greenham burst out. Tyrants, remember, said Beccanari, almost cheerfully. But I'm sure that the audit will serve to sort out at least some aspects of this mystery. One of them, of course, is that Mr. Reacher Gilt does not seem to be in this room. Every head turned. Perhaps he remembered another engagement, said Lord Beccanari. I think he slipped out some time ago. It dawned on the directors of the Crown's truck that their chairman was absent and, which was worse, they weren't. I wonder if, uh, at this point, at least we could discuss the matter with you privately, Your Lordship, said William. Preacher was not an easy matter to deal with, I'm afraid. Not a team taken over by the city. Stand by. Oh, Stand by. so much for future Stand happiness. Stand no, my lord, said Boyce. Veterinary raised an eyebrow. 
Then is an alternative, Mr. Lipig? It really is private property, sir. It belongs to the Deer Hearts and the other people who built it. My, my, how the worm turns, said Vetinari. But the trouble is, you see, they weren't good at business and they mechanisms. Otherwise, they would have seen through guilt. The freedom to succeed goes hand in hand. It was robbery by numbers, said Royce. It was find a lady done with ledgers. They didn't stand a chance. Vetinari sighed. You drive up to the bar with it. Waved a hand vaguely. The two men walked. 